Welcome to Reader Syndicate 3.0, the next evolution of the look into counterculture that is canon. My name is Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds, and this started as a one-man mission for strain history and breeding science. Over time, it's evolved into something bigger, better, and more of a team effort. We will be joined by members of the Can Illuminati and other friends throughout the seasons to hear their takes on grow techniques, breeding science, strain history, and more. Our mission is to combat the narrative that corporate cannabis and seed posers are obfuscating for their own financial benefit. Welcome to the underground. We are the Syndicate. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Matt. Today, I'm here with Stacy J, a.k.a. Muir, as he was known on the forums. Um, I've been chasing you down for a long time. You're a very well-respected member uh, of our community, and it's an honor to have you on. I don't know. Have you done other interviews yet? Uh, I did a, an interview with my buddy uh, Chip Baker and the, okay. the, what was it, the, the Real, Real Dirt, Dirt Baker. Yeah. Did that a couple times, but that's it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm more of a stand at the back of the room kind of guy. I know you need to be at the front, man, because you have a lot of, you have a lot of history and uh, a lot of answers and a lot of stuff I'd like to dig out of you. So first and foremost, we usually dive into the easy stuff, which is what was your earliest intro to weed as far as just smoking your first intro to seeing this plant that is cannabis? Well, <clears throat> I grew up with, uh, I grew up around, uh, uh, early charismatic Christians and 1% bikers. My old man had a excavating company and he had a lot of, uh, uh, bikers who were in a club called the pagans. And, yeah. um, so I, I, one of the, my favorite, most awesome smells I ever smelled was herb burning in my old man's office. And, uh, it's just the best smell ever and probably first smoked it 13 ish. Yeah. Sounds um, about right. At probably uh church camp. <laughs> yeah. So were your parents, the charismatic Christians? My mom was, but my dad was, uh, was a, a coke head. Or, yeah. <laughs> or a, a raving coke addict more than a coke head. Charismatic coke head. <laughs> evangelical cokehead. Yeah, I had one of those too. Awesome. <laughs> so, what kind of weed was around when you first started smoking? Like, uh, what 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 era were we looking at? Well, when I was sixteen, and that's when I became enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, you know, you get out from under your parents' wing. It's easy. You got your car. You can go get some herb, and so all. I wouldn't say that. Everything that you would have seen in the uh, the old high times, trans high mm -hmm. market quotation, there was a variety of imports. Um, if you were a little bit older than me, you would be much more savvy. You know, I was, you know, 16 and getting whatever it was that the older guys were selling. But you had everything from Jamaican to Colombian to I think the first QP I bought was uh, Acapulco Gold, and it was down on the D.C. line because I grew up in, in the D.C. suburbs of Maryland. Yeah. And uh, uh, the D.C. line area was a traditional illegal sales area and where we mm -hmm. could always buy underage booze or, or what have you. And, and that was real golden. Yeah. Pot. Um, there was some Thai weed. Um, never saw any Thai stick. And then it just became pretty much Mexi. And then became Mexi and Kind Bud. So yeah. there was there was two kinds of pot. It was, you know, commercial. And most of the commercial that was getting to me in the D.C. area, which I sold, you know, brick weed and grew my own pot. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff was ironically coming via Colorado Springs and, and Boulder. Oh, wow. So, so what, college kid network. Were you, were you just uh, popping seeds that you had from your stash when you were first started growing? 
I first popped seeds when I was 17, right before I went into Army Reserves on a bet. Oh, no. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the seeds weren't there when I got, or the plants weren't there when I came back. <laughs> Did they get harvested? Did they get I have grown? No idea. Harvested? No uh, idea. It wasn't, it wasn't me. <laughs> but clones, you know, it back then when I started to grow, I, I think it would have been uh, the thing that I have in my in my mind as a timestamp of that era of beginning was uh, it was uh, the Grateful Dead version of uh, the, the the Warlock shows in uh, Hampton. And I'm not okay. a big dead show, but that's like, okay, this is when I started growing. So this is about 89 and clones were, they were really hard to get and seeds were really hard to get. And I knew some people in Virginia and they grew like mass super skunk. Mm -hmm. um, probably the first real seeds that I popped that were not you know throw away mexi seeds would have been a, a hash haze cross and okay. ironically again those seeds had an origin they were made in eagle colorado and this old grower that i knew went on a road trip and he brought these seeds back and we had a shit ton of them we grew that pot a lot and it's still what I consider kind bud. It, it's still that that imprinted profile that knows that I don't know. It's, it's like good ganja when it wasn't good ganja. I mean, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of good. Yeah, ganja. yeah. Was it long flowering since it was a haze hybrid? No, we didn't flower shit long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, didn't have a chance to flower it fucking long, right? No, <laughs> no, that is definitely we learned along the way. Yeah, but uh, you know, it was it was it was typical. It wasn't uh, it, it wasn't some long flowering thing. So this is all while you're in D.C. and Maryland. It kind of just like it it, it it's weird to me because I think about D.C. and like the risks involved with that being some kind of extra federal territory. Well, you know, ironically in the early nineties, I believe it would have been uh, during a, a Clinton administration that someone in DC and DuPont circle mm -hmm. called the white house and threatened the president and he had plants growing and he was tripping balls and I believe that that was the first cultivation arrest in Washington, D.C. But but Maryland was scary and Virginia was really scary. The grocery store that we went to was called Home Harvest. And he was, uh, you know, from the prankster school, prankster school of thought, the mm -hmm. yippee um, uh, early normal organizer and he always put his grocery stores right next to the bong and dildo stores. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, it was a great strategy. It worked for him for a long All time. All in one, go get yeah. your bongs, go get your dildos. You're set. Yeah, and that, that, that store was called home harvest and the guy's name was Jeff Edwards and, and he's dead now, but uh, he's a real inspiration to my business harvest house. And, uh, Really, really good guy, a really incredible resource to have. You know, you've got to remember that this is the, uh, you know, just post Operation Green Merchant era. And yeah. everybody was scared shitless because they were very free and ordering everything online with credit cards. And all of a sudden, you know, the, everything, uh, it came to an end. And, you know, you went from being carefree and casual to people walking a quarter mile down the road to the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild. So yeah. at what point did you shoot out to Colorado? Or is there any anything we should cover before then that you can think of? Uh, 
Well, I did uh, I did ten months in San Rafael, Santa Venetia, outside of San Rafael. Okay. Um, not too. I mean, first time I ever paid fifty five bucks for an eighth. That was shocking to me. <laughs> I bet, uh, dude. Uh, you know, but that was like ninety four. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that was definitely not the not the high point of my growing career. Moved back to Maryland, but, uh, you know, ended up uh, in Colorado from briefly in 97 and then full time, never leaving again in 98. And what moved you out there? Everybody that I knew in Maryland who didn't um, move to the Bay Area, California, Northern California, yeah. ended up moving to Netherland, Colorado. Uh, so I had a, a really huge, uh, not huge, but I had a, a bunch of friends here and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's got a really big musical history. It's a kind of a hippie enclave, kind of the way, like Laurel Canyon or, uh, yeah. similar places where, uh, band members in the seventies congregated. You had the, uh, Caribou Ranch recording studio just outside of town that tons of music was recorded at. It's a big drug town, music town. In the 90s, it was uh, you could bar hop in this town most nights amongst like three, four places and hear live music. And it's a town of about 1,400. Yeah. So, um, but all of that has changed. Colorado's changed. You know, the world's changed. COVID and all the money changed Colorado. So there's very, you know, we had um, eight or nine pre-regulation pot shops in this town. Mine was one. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not a pot town anymore. That's too bad. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, it's not a pot town anymore. So. So when you got to Colorado, what kind of strains were kicking around Colorado that you remember first encountering? The ones I brought. <laughs> right. So what were you bringing over there? I had just um, gone to Mark Emery's and, uh, and bought four grand worth of seed. Oh, man. Spent four grand with him. Ah, yeah. Jesus. Especially during Got me. Night. Yeah, <laughs> we all get got it sometime. Um, I'll tell you the I'll tell you the the seed story, you know. So, sure. or the strip search story. Yeah, um, this, this is one I want to hear. So you know, Mark had that magazine that was basically a format for his catalog, but yeah, the first. I don't know, eight pages of the damn thing. And, and in it, I mean, it was like, fuck, oh my God, look at this. It was, I want this, I want this, I want this, Absolutely. I want this. And, uh, you know, it was a mix of really expensive Dutch seed. And that was in reality, probably not authentic. Yeah. Um, and tons of BC strains that I wish still had, you know, access or even memory of. Yeah. Um, so I go in, you know, here I am, I'm young, hadn't really traveled too much. And, uh, you know, it's Hastings area was, you know, Junkieville back then. And mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, I don't know, it was a kind of city I was not exposed to. Yeah. Um, Meet Mark, go do the deal. Mark gives me uh, handwritten directions to a town called Tofino on the Sunshine Coast. Okay. And uh, got to go there. Hot, you know, talking it up. Well, the weather was shitty and and rainy, and I got the worst hotel in the world full of old <laughs> creepy motherfuckers. Yeah. And, like, bored. I, I mean, it was the only room, and it was just torrentially raining so and i'm i'm not uh i'm 
I'm not a receipt saver, but I just happened to have the receipt for that night. And uh, I come to meet one of the people that sells seeds to Mark from Europe. And Mm -hmm. man, we hit it off. We're going to go into business, do all this. I've got all this business plans and stuff in my notebook. And and uh, he's like, well, what, what, what are you doing with your seeds? I said, well, I, I'm just going to bring them home. Mark said nobody's ever been interdicted. Yeah. And uh, he's like, oh, no, you can't do that. You got to send them back to yourself. So I delay my flight. And uh, mail them back, meet the guy the next morning on the street, smoke a couple, three joints, jump in the cab. And I feel in my pocket the big of the day, pink federal express receipt. Yeah. And, uh, I'm I'm totally stoned in the back of the, of the the cab. And I'm thinking when I get to the airport, throw this away. And I had this little nervous habit of folding shit up and then rolling it up. And yeah, I do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, a a potish is uh, one of the names for the little nervous things that you do. And, yeah. So I jump out of the cab. I throw this thing in my pocket and I walk into the BC airport and there's dogs at the door and they sit down as I walk by them. And they're like, you go right over there. And I'm like, holy fuck, there's U.S. <laughs> customs in the BC airport. No, I mean, I had no idea. It was like yeah. driving across California line with, you know, 300 clones in a cooler and not realizing there's an agricultural checkpoint. Yeah, right. And nobody told yeah. me this. So <laughs> there's... Uh, there I am. The DEA or the uh, the customs and immigration has got me against the unworking conveyor belt with my backpack all exploded all over the place and looking at all of my seed packages that I'm going to take and put back in my, you know, when I get back oh, no. to America, along with, you know, several dozen packs of rolling papers you couldn't get in the U S and my uh, written down business plans that I'm going to do with this guy. So this little old lady who is a supervisor, I'm trying to be nice to her. And and the other dude comes over and he's bad cop with me. And, and uh, they're all fucking with somebody else. And I'm standing there with my, ass to the conveyor belt and i feel that fucking receipt in my pocket i'm like this is the only thing between like me and 100 percent good and so i'm watching and i'm watching and i, and I, I eat the receipt because it's all <laughs> yeah yeah and they see me and they scream he's eating it he's eating it and they they come from everywhere i uh, know they swarm me Take me into an examination room while this uh, DE or the customs guy starts talking about if do I have a sign on my house that says what I do or how long you've been doing? They know all, all kinds of like cop mind fuck shit. Yeah. And uh, they couldn't strip search me okay. because I was on Canadian territory. So they had to go get a Mountie to strip search me. Ooh. Well, I have this handwritten directions to Tofino. Well, during this period of time, the the Hells Angels, I believe, and other biker groups were kind of at war and mm-hmm. and uh, intimidating growers and making deals. And there was a long and short of it. There was a um, a pot industry related murder that occurred in Tofino. On the night that I stayed in that shitty hotel and had the receipt. So until I presented that receipt, they were concerned about me being involved with that murder. So it was just a totally crazy, weird thing. And uh, I made it home and they never came to my house. How deep was the strip search? You know, I bent over and didn't stick anything up my ass, but uh, <laughs> so we all but, wanted to know. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was it was just uh, you know, just uh, external. Yeah, just a little peep peep show. A little peep For, show. Fortunately, it wasn't the Americans. Yeah, right. Yeah, they go deep. They go deep with it. 
Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that, that those were uh, great seeds, but you know, in hindsight, I'm pretty sure they the Dutch stuff wasn't real. And, you know, the guy's a scoundrel. So did the seeds? Did you actually ever end up getting the seeds that you had sent, or was oh it yeah, yeah, yeah I grew them for years. Yeah, I grew all sorts of stuff. Do you remember what what kind of strains you were trying to grab at the time, specifically? Any of them? Well, you know, it was you know, since he was the dominant, yeah, thing back then, and I I think that uh, I think for the most part, the except for maybe maple leaf indica. Mm -hmm. I think out of all, that was the only thing from Cincy that ended up like sticking around for a while. Um, I grew, uh, oh, no, 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 no. I'm thinking of a different, a different, different seed buying. That was the Amsterdam gotcha. um, trip. So in the early days, there was a guy named uh, Mike Parks who had a company called Weed Seed. Okay. And Weed Seed was a British company that went to Holland and bought seeds and mailed them from England yeah. in uh, fake uh, Lady Di memorabilia. And uh, I went over there with him and met uh, like Simon and. Uh, Oh, Sagamartha. Yeah. Uh, I'm having a brain cramp on his Tony. name. Tony. Yeah. yeah. Tony. Uh, I actually met him when he was in on this side. Uh, but, you know, the when I got to Colorado, I was burning through those seeds. Um, and a lot of the typical stuff that you would hear about in Fort Collins. My computer is doing some weird shit. Let me quit something. All right. Yeah, the Colorado strains, uh, burning through the seeds. Well, you know, I was hooked up with the 77 guys, so I was growing whatever they were growing. Let's talk about that because, you know, um, I think some of us that were from uh, the Four Amero, some of us got a good idea of the 77 crew, but even for me, it's kind of like the, just this mythical group of guys that were doing what I wanted to do, but I was doing it decades later. So I'd love to hear some more about the 77 crew. How did it get started? What was it? And what was the goal behind it? Well, so the there wasn't a whole lot of internet resources, obviously, at that sure. point. So Hemp BC... Mm -hmm. um, had an HTML website that was completely basic. And I was not computer savvy at all during that period of time. But all of a sudden, you could make usernames and you could make these little back rooms. Yeah. And, you know, like how I got my name was... Uh, I had just traveled around California. I was totally in the Muir Woods and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and all that shit. So I was in a flame war with uh, AB Hybrid. Yeah. Later. And uh, Ron, who uh, you know, it's uh, PGA, yeah. suggested that I change my handle um, after this vicious back and forth with. Uh, Looney. Fucking hype. And because uh, he went by Luminator back then and he used the big 1500 watt stadium bulb. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. He was totally easy to fuck with. Yeah. yeah. By <laughs> Luminator. And uh, Hype did? He went by yeah. Luminator? Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. So when he found out my name was Muir. Yeah. He's like, yeah, you know, put an exclamation point on the end of it. And I and I kept it ever since. <laughs> but the you know, so the 77 was this guy, Eric, 77. And okay. he was the guy that passed around the the very orange Calio. Yep. A.E. 77. Got. And uh, 
He worked out of a shop, didn't he? What, what was his shop he worked out of? He Berkeley Patients Group, maybe, or lived oh, in my. Florida. He lived in Florida. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Totally. Not, not California. He might have ended up. I don't. He he might have ended up with Ron in California at some point, but gotcha. not at that point. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. I think he died down south. Gotcha. So the seventy seven was a back room that was organized by Eric, okay. and it became the seventy seven. Um, Vic High had yeah. um. A back room, I can't remember what it was called, but a lot of the, these people had their little things, and you would set up things and burn them, and uh, and then a group of us, you know, kind of congealed in in the seventy seven, and I think we all moved from uh, Hemp BC. There was a early website called laughing moon i'm sure you're familiar with laughing moon. laughing moon yep they were famous for having some insanely priced kong clone yep i remember the kong yeah yeah so i think that that's the first place i remember strain base maybe being okay and we had ended up with a back room on that website, the Laughing Moon website, that gotcha. became known as the 77. Okay. So that was uh, like the established 77 base at that point. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, and, and from those guys, you know, came the the uh, overgrow and, and, and cannabis world. Yeah. So, and they had, you know, you know, Ron was the first person that I went to and met in California and I I became close with California people because there was a perceived safety with people who are operating under the California medical yeah rules. So definitely a perceived safety for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh so was the 77 crew was it was it essentially a way to move clones across the nation to trade or is it just dudes just hanging out and chilling that no it's just a bunch of dorks you know um you know you had uh i was never into it but the mirc or whatever yeah 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 internet relay chat yeah you know a lot of those those guys what's that i was one of those dorks i bet yeah for punk rock though yeah yeah (laughs) but you know a lot of those a lot of those guys had a weird, weird way about them. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, you're wondering what other weird shit they're lurking around on. Yeah. So, <laughs> what other channels they're on when you're not playing. Um, I always looked at those those guys a little a little odd, but a little sus. Um, you know, it's really wild to to see, you know, really well known names who, you know, started out not knowing shit and you know just this weird little dorks on cannabis websites. Right. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. So, but you know, the, the 77, you know, there was a, a time where those guys really took that shit seriously and wouldn't, you know, even type out the 77. They would put asterisks in it or. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. So, you know, secret agent shit. Yeah. Took it super serious. But, you know, through the years, I traveled to meet a lot of the folks that I could conveniently and even some that weren't convenient. And there's always been a extreme willingness to share. Yeah. I, I, there's no way that the 77 was set up to to share clones but we shared the shit out of clones yeah you know this was at the point where most of us couldn't even post a, an image online yeah right so uh so what else can i tell you let's see 77 crew we got that tell us some of the notable characters i mean right around the time 
that um, Cannon World and Overgrow started? What, are, what were some of the guys that, that left good impressions on you or negative impressions on you for that matter? Yeah. You know, because that's always interesting. Negative too, right? ones are easy. Um, yeah. You know, Subcool is the first negative <laughs> one that comes yeah. to my mind. <laughs> Same um, here. It's weird how that works. I was like, boom. Okay. Uh, well, we can start with him. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he, his, he tried to get me to come to Georgia and grow pot with him. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, and then it just became series of disasters after disaster for that guy. Yeah. Um, so he was probably, uh, the most, uh, the most negatively notable, you know, I think, um, people like Ron, um, uh, yeah. NCGA is really, uh, you know, with his, uh, his events and yes. the stuff that he did to support other people in their endeavors. And, uh, you know, I, I think Ron used to have, uh, what do you call I, I think Chip and I would call it the, the, the old, the old guy rescue program. I can't remember exactly how we, we would, we called it, but he would, uh, you know, he would take these guys from um, other parts of the country and help them get a foothold in, yeah, in his area. And it was, uh, it was cool to watch him do his thing, you know, uh, yeah, he definitely helped me too. Same way, same yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, an amazing guy, whole another generation. You know, you know, and and for me, a lot of these guys were older than me. Yeah. So when I got into this, you know, circle, I, I was really a younger, younger one of the circle. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a lot less of them. You know, a lot of them came and. Uh, you know, I don't know. Did you ever meet Scoosh or hear of Scoosh? Scoosh, I've heard of him. Never yeah. met him. Yeah. Yeah. He, I think he was one of the people involved with like the server for uh, Overgrow. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Colorado ended up getting a lot of genetics through my connections, you know, like the, uh, you know, Nabu's Cherry Lime is yeah. one that um, I gave flat of hundred, hundreds, 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 hundreds away. Um, and, you know, Cherry Lime Ricky, right? Cherry Lime Ricky. And yep. he, in that batch, there was a strawberry something and uh, Jacqueline Orange, Jackie O. Jackie O. That's right. Um, yeah. that was Flash. From, from that era. Yeah. But the, did he get your sour from you too? I don't know if he got the sour from me or not. I sent, um, a, a grip of those West with, uh, Ron one year on his yearly trip. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense then. Yeah. And that would have been around, uh, 99 2000 ish where did you uh because because a lot of people don't know like csi he attributes his sour coming around via you so where did you uh acquire the sour at how did you run into it early on so i had this dude who was my running partner at the time um he was uh half Pakistani and uh, half white kid from New Jersey. No, from uh, the Bronx. Yeah. And he knew a bunch of deadheads in Crested Butte who had this cut-in called Sour Diesel. And it was getting stupid money. Like, like, like great. I mean, yeah. regular pot was 4,800 bucks, you know? Yeah. So, this was, you know, I, I, I can't even quote what it was, but it was, it was at that time. It was like, holy shit. And uh, yeah. everybody's like, it's different. It's different. It's different. And I'm like, ah, there's nothing different. And, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And so I got my cutting from these guys that my buddy knew from dead tour. And they took all their herb back 
to New York to sell it from Crested Butte. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where my my cutting came from, and it's it's still there. But I, I think it's there's it's like a shadow of itself. I, I I wouldn't ever fuck with it, but it's still grown in in the valley. But it's it's all dead tour related. Yeah, that makes sense. That's all. Um, you know, that's, that's where, it, that's how it got around. So you mentioned you weren't like much of a dead guy. What kind of stuff are you into? I mean, I, I like, I like the dead. I like the dead. I like to say that I came for the drugs and stayed for the music. Um, <laughs> you know, I grew up, I grew up in a crazy Christian church and was ejected from that at 16 and, and landed in the DC punk scene. Yeah. And, uh, that was uh, mid eighties. Epicenter, man. Di- Discord. Yeah. Um, government issue. Uh, I never saw a minor threat, but uh, you know all of those Discord bands and uh, most incredible show I ever saw was Butthole Surfers open for uh, the Dead Kennedys. That's why. And man i've never seen anything like that in my life still to this day it's I bet. it's in the top three four shows that i've seen impacting like the amount of energy Ed kennedy shouldn't have even come on stage <laughs> really butthole service did that good oh my god i i i was yeah i was high as shit on a bunch of pagan crank and uh, <laughs> it was Mark one of the crank. most insane experiences ever you know because we had listened to these albums Sure. And, you know, there's a fucking tuba on those albums, those early bows. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, holy fuck, you know, there's a big white tuba on stage. And it was, the, you know, I've seen a lot of Allman Brothers and Grateful Dead, two drum <laughs> bands. But, yeah, you know, Butthole Servers was the first band I ever saw with two drummers. So it Yeah, was, that's wild. It was great. And, you know, growing up in... Uh, and the DC area was awesome. It was a small city. It was approachable. It was relatively safe. And uh, it's great music. Yeah, dude, that's a killer um, time to grow up in DC. For, so for I kind of, I, kind of tri- I, I became a real into pot. And when I got really into pot, I really wanted to, to grow it and sell it. And that's how I ended up going to see a lot of dead shows. And I have a lot of Grateful Dead head friends but you know i'm i'm a lot more into like early jerry projects versus like the warlocks no like uh like legion of mary and and i'm not familiar with that stuff with merle saunders and uh yeah not not dead jerry stuff yeah yeah uh but that's all fascinating to me i mean the warlocks are kind of like a they were one of those they're often considered proto-punk in in many ways so that's one of the bands that always interests me there's a a a record out with the falling spikes which were velvet underground before they were velvet underground and on the b side is uh the warlocks that's out there somewhere Mm. it's pretty cool yeah Yeah. music nerd history there you go (laughs) what do you know about the dhk crew were you ever were you ever involved with any of that no, no, no. There was Unrelated. I mean, I, I, I know the name. Yeah. Who, who was in it? Fuck if I know. Um, Reach, Reach was probably in yeah. that. If I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. Not me. No one I really jive with. Okay. Uh, Colorado famous lines and cuts. Here we go. Let's hear some. Uh, we have the P bud. And I, I've talked to you briefly about this before. What do you know about the pea bud? Uh, the pea as- bud was grown in a town called Paonia. Yeah. Um, it's a name that is kind of a generic name. Mm-hmm. Um, the What people typically talk about as pea bud, I believe, would be called um, Paonia Purple Paralyzer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that guy uh, that I sent you the seeds of. Yeah. 
the story that he tells me was that, uh, you know, Boulder was in the early 70s was a pretty significant hippie community. And it was uh, an earlier place of uh, for marijuana trade and sales. I, I mean, I was surprised in hearing the stories from this guy that there wasn't ganja everywhere, but it, it, it was a, a developing market at this point. Gotcha. Um, so supposedly some hippies left Boulder and moved to Paonia. And that's where the pay, the pea bud comes from same line as, as what you have just, yeah. uh, just separated 20 some years ago. Um, but that, that purple herb was also grown in towns like Gardner, which was in the wet mountain Valley where you have, you know, uh, you know, leave us alone kind of hippie type sure. communities but that don't really exist anymore. Um, not, not the way that they did then, but you know, that's, uh, you know, that's the only really what I would consider like, uh, heirloom kind of hot spot. Yeah. The Paonia and maybe Gardner. Um, but these, you know, le you know, places like Leadville, it's over 10,000 feet. Um, you know, so a lot of these places where everybody went to live in the mountains and smoke ganja and grow ganja, it's really, really hard to grow outside. Yeah, because you, know, you can have, um, you know, four inches of hail in August. Oh, I bet. And, and it's just you don't have anything and it sticks out. And, you know, it's like dirt and rocks and, and pine trees around here. It's yeah, yeah. not it's not an easy, easy place to grow outdoors. But Paonia is a farming area. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure it, it's still there and I'm sure there's still people just in the same way that you've got hippies on the mountain in NorCal that, you know, are still doing stuff that's their own stuff. Yeah. And not what everybody else is doing. So I think it's here. I, I've often thought of trying to do what you do for Colorado and try to get out there and capture some of the stories because you know, California is is the mothership, in in my opinion. Um, and Colorado is is a long, uh, a long standing ganja state, but Absolutely. it's it's more of a. I mean, long before Denver became the center of ganja in Colorado, sure. it was. You know, it was Nederland. It was Leadville. It was uh, Durango. It, it was not Denver. It was everywhere but Denver. That's not where, you know, until people started blowing up shitty warehouses. <laughs> right. you know, that yeah. that was that was ganja was not, Denver is not a ganja town. That was like 2016. It became the the ganja center. Would you say? around the time of the the legalization the first cannabis cup type shit well you know all these early gardens were you know denver was full of empty warehouses that were sitting and not doing anything so there was lots of cheap real estate that you could yeah. get into nobody had any experience i actually uh ended up in one of these early uh warehouses you know nobody had designed hvac systems for it yet yeah and nobody could grow pot without powdery mildew in the, those environments and the herb was so horrible that it it's responsible for the concentrate boom yeah you know? yeah for sure you, you for had sure. all of this herb that was so powdery mildew ridden that nobody could do shit with it you couldn't yep. Uh, blast it. There'd be dumpsters full of fucking <laughs> butane cans. People 
smoking a cigarette. And within sight of my store here, there is a house blow up. Within sight that way, there was a house blow up. Jesus. Um, three houses in the town of Netherlands during that open blasting era, you know. So, you know, you can bitch about regulations, but that's one thing for sure that I'm glad we got past. People get pissed when you say that too, like that the extract artist whole idea came because a bunch of people tried growing weed and were really shitty at it and had to try to move it somehow, which became the BHO boom. I mean, that to me, that's it was just so evident watching it. But people I, don't like hearing that. Well, I remember, and, and even the 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 gross ass way that that shit was smoked on those like titanium skillets and yeah, yeah. Oh man, fiery and red. The first earwax. You get some dude, he'd come, you'd get whatever it was that you were going to have him blast. And, and, uh, the shit sold for a hundred dollars a gram. And it was wow. like gelatinous. <laughs> I, it looked like fucking earwax. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Those yeah, are the it's, days. It's all because nobody could grow pot to begin with. Yeah. And they still needed to move it to they still needed to make a return therefore and, now, and this is how you smoke it yeah <laughs> let yeah. me tell you that too and, and mm -hmm. you know it is really crazy i uh you know after having closed my store my last store in february that's right i, I have to buy my uh my cannabis now until i have a harvest and uh it sucks buying that shit man yeah, it's dude. really amazing but i have a, a source actually um and it's not like six star pinkies up mm -hmm. i'm buying this eight gram tub for 96 dollars jesus 96 dollars what is that? Twelve bucks a gram. Yeah, one hundred and twenty bucks after tax out the door. So, you know the 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 pot industry prices are have plummeted, man. That's yeah, really yeah. glad that that I'm not in it anymore. It's uh, but it's great. I can buy. I can smoke a, a gram a day and not have it really hurt my pocketbook too bad. Yeah, that's not too bad, right? Yeah, I ended up getting a um the that cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome from dabbing. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it oh, fucked yeah. you up super bad. So I learned my lesson not to, you know, dab every 10 minutes. It kind of turned me off to extracts permanently. But I had to go I through my own. That. Yeah, yeah. I had to go through my own uh round of buying my own cannabis because I, you know, knocked down the grows and shit because I was throwing up too much, couldn't run anything uh yeah it's a bitch it's a bitch i'll tell you yeah i've i've had friends that have been unable to smoke and be growers and uh one of them just is able to smoke again now so it's it's hard yeah i've, I've, I've gone the 11 months now that, that i was told i need to go fully without smoking once you know wow 11 fucking months of hell I'll tell you what, dude. No edibles, too, right? No, no nothing. No cannabinoids. Nothing. Not a thing. Yeah, I did the the amount I was puking? It wasn't even worth it to even try. So I figured I'd do the full eleven months, and not try to skimp on it just in case it pops back up too soon. Yeah, it's a trip. It's a trip. A lot of people don't believe it exists either until it actually happens, and then you realize, fuck, that shit sucks. I think of the reason a lot of people don't believe it is that there were that there were doctors that were trying to hang a lot of shit that wasn't it. Yeah. As it. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's a lot of people saying, Oh, it's just neem oil. You know, oh, it's just this, it's just fucking this. It's just fucking this. You know, you can get it from the cleanest source and it doesn't matter if you're doing it too much. I know for me, BHO live resin, I mm -hmm. can't smoke it because it gives me instant inflammation. Yeah. It's just not a good experience. I like the flavor of it, and but it's just not a good experience. 
same. You know, I loved the flavor of it. It was, and I was using, you know, like a Carta or a Puffco. So it was nice and easy. Push the button three times, could dab every 10 minutes like a crackhead, you know, cure what ails you. And then all of a sudden, you know, eight months later, you're throwing up your guts. But it's, it's the logical end to someone with addictive personalities, you know, like you always hear cannabis can't kill you, right? Well, let's see. Well, let's see. Let's put this shit to the test, you know, and then they end up in renal failure and shit. Uh, yeah. So tell me what you're doing now, dude, since you've uh, closed Harvest House, right? Yeah. Well, I'm, I have a new business with a similar name, Harvest House, uh, Colorado. Yeah. Um, I've got my space that was my dispensary. Uh, it's a, in a little A-frame in Nederland. And i um, going to basically make it a, 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 a format for a, a, a showcase for cannabis and try to uh, recruit new home growers, make it the, 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 the anti-pot store store. I um, love that. Uh, equip people to build their rooms, uh, whether they want to become familiar with living soil or salts, mm -hmm. um, provide a, a place for vendors to do pop-ups, provide a place for uh, breeders to do pop-ups, glass people to do pop-ups, try to run a, a, a really cannabis culture themed session on saturdays um once i get that going try to find uh someone who is interested enough in plant medicine and psychedelics that are uh kosher in in colorado to uh use the space on sundays to give some education and you know maybe uh share techniques I, i'm not into mushrooms and dealing with tripping people. So it's not yeah. something that, that I really have an interest in, but I think that there's a need for education and I, and I have a spot. Uh, so, but we're going to do, uh, do the Saturdays starting mid September. And uh, the other thing that I'm doing is I, I have a, a hemp license where I am doing a clone company. Yeah. And, uh, Providing clones, walk in, or uh, deliver them, or or ship them. So yeah, I mean that's that's a very successful way to to do business right now. Even even from the seed market, I've seen that uh, a lot of seed guys are just moving over just to clones. Um, so I'm very interested to see how that goes for you. It's, uh, I think it'll be successful, especially with what you got going on with the education and everything else you're doing. Well, it's, I think it's, it's uh, it makes it a lot more fun if you can choose what you want to grow and you don't just have the option of growing whatever it is that you can get. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have a lot of uh, access these days. But there's still a lot of people who feel like they have to gatekeep. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I'm not one person that jives with, uh, you know, something that came through my my hands and it's, you know, it's got some like part of me to it. Like, and I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I've never understood the, you know, you know, the, the uh, the elitism. Well, you know, sour diesel is a, is a really good example of you know everybody's got their their story. Uh, they've all got the idea of what it is, how it got named, that mm -hmm. um, all that shit, man. I I really don't give a fuck about. I I I am I have always had access to clones through friends. I'm not a a, a clone hoarder. I've never been a, a person who um, gets tight with shit. And yeah. uh, I, 
I have been shared with freely and I, I'll tell people, don't give it to me if you don't want me to, 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 well, and now sell it. So yeah, right. <laughs> not, just, not just, not just share it, uh, you know, cause I I've given many, 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 many thousands of clothes. Absolutely. Away. Um, and unfortunately not a whole lot of them have ever come back. <laughs> That, isn't that how it goes, though? That's how it goes. It hey, is, man, uh, could you fill my room up? You, can yeah, you, can right? you get flat? Hey. Hello. <laughs> could I get a jar or, like, something? Hey, could I get that clone back? I'll give you oh, a snip. Bro, sorry. Hey, what? <laughs> you know, CSI gave me great advice a long time ago, and he said never attach yourself to one clone. He said, for many reasons, because the second you let it go, it's no longer yours. And if you've attached your name and built a reputation with it, what are you going to be left with? Always be working towards something else and keep moving. Because That's the best way to do it. Don't feel like you've got to lock shit down. Don't attach your ego to it. And, you know, like it, it, say, it sounds easy. It sounds really easy. But when you get, you get something very rare, Everybody seems to get that golem syndrome, you know, and once you once you learn to get rid of that, you get to start moving forward and uh, creating new. And at that point, everybody else is using your tailing. So who gives a shit? I mean, there's not much out there that's worth much more than anything else, you know, right in the for, as a flower. So, I mean, I, I don't think that people do value a, a, a clone really the way that they should. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of work to, to, to make a selection and yeah, it should be. Um, but a lot of these clones were selected, you know, two, two seeds popped in a two by four closet and just called elite. And that's, and that's the, uh, that's the exactly. yeah. Yeah, man. So let's see, what else do we got? I want to hear your, um, your take since you've been on both ends of the spectrum. Um, legal versus the traditional market what were some of the pros of the legal market versus some of the pros of traditional and and what do you think will win out in the end for uh for guys like us well i think that there i think that there's a the way we started is not the way it is now um you know, I was uh, an unregulated shop. Mm -hmm. I was operating under medical marijuana rules, which were kind of bullshit. Um, and I operated through the the promulgation of the earliest rules and withdrew my application for my medical marijuana shop in 2011, as the regulations took a first regulations took effect. Now, in all of that time to right now, I've never seen advocates win. Yeah. Advocates have passion and they have emotion and they have often lots of energy. But lobbyists win every time. Yep. Every time. So we had a a, a a a vibrant small business community where I grew pot and I sold pot, but that's not what everybody else was. You had people making edibles. You had people making, well, there weren't really concentrate makers yet right at that earliest point. Um but the state made everybody become vertically integrated and that caused people to get into relationships that were called shotgun marriages. Yeah. They were forced into a business relationship. So you had people that were great growers. You had people that could sling herb, you know, and mm -hmm. they were forced together. And in my early situation where I had a, a, you might have known him. Uh, do you ever know uh, No Good Names Left? Sean Lucas? No. Forms. Well, I had a early partnership where I was involved with a, 
you know, a, a Denver warehouse that was a t uh, along with my um, uh, my shop in Netherland. But the uh, we had a falling out at that point. And a man divorce ended up with yeah. a, a restraining order against me. I couldn't go get my genetics from the place. And my, I, I didn't lose my company. I didn't get fucked over. I didn't allow myself to get fucked over, but yeah. most people didn't end up in a, in a good situation or prevailing after being in a bad relationship. So sure. that started it all off. And then you had industry groups, initially marijuana, medical marijuana industry group became marijuana industry group, MIG. And, and those people, they write all of it, you know? And, yeah. and so if we fast forward down to today where, you know, Colorado was, was very innovative and it had a uh, diverse businesses. Now the, I am of the opinion that you have two factions going against each other. You have the hemp based intoxicant market mm -hmm. and you have the traditional dispensary regulated THC. And there's a lot of people making a shit ton of money in not THC. Yeah. As we all know, and, and, and not just like the, the shady uh, high THCA. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah trend that's going on right now but the the latest changes in the colorado regulatory scheme i think really tell it all in cannabis is a consumer package good it's part of the cpg industry it's a segment of the cpg industry the c-suite executives that are brought in to lead these large MSO companies or companies that are getting rolled up and trying to be something they're coming from the consumer package, good industry. Yeah. So the, you know, pot is biologically active. There's shit growing on it. It's, it's got yeast and mold on it. That isn't dangerous. Yeah. There is the potential for things to be dangerous. And I'm not saying that, Regulations aren't unnecessary, but I think that the regulations are heading in a direction where the pot that you find in a store is going to be sterile. Yeah. No, however it is that they sterilize it. So pot has to have a shelf life. It can't have, you know, when the, when the, when the terpenes are, are no longer being produced, they're beaten back those, those that those fungal funguses, the black, the what is it? The God, I, they're just doing the hydrogen peroxide dip for the most part on a lot of this stuff, aren't they? No, uh, they they're irradiating it. They are um, this is great. all sorts of shit. You know, so in large companies they irradiate it before it ever gets packaged. Mm. You know, so. Now, in Colorado, before you were un, you were not allowed to sell prepared food like potato chips and drinks in your yeah. store that didn't have THC in them, and you can't have hemp derived THC in them either. So now the new rules allow for you to get as much as twenty percent of your revenue from selling popcorn and potato chips and shit. So it's, it's in a full move towards a convenience store model in Colorado. In my opinion, that's the, yeah. the direction that it's going in. And, and I would anticipate it going that way across the country, wherever those CPG companies can get the rules tweaked for them. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the end result is going to be that we'll be able to buy pretty much 
pot across the country and at some point maybe there'll be exclusions but and some states won't drive ever i don't know but if you go to some shithole market in nebraska you can buy a tomato in yeah. the winter time you go to new mexico or california or florida you can buy a tomato the type of tomato that you will be able to buy is dependent upon how it can be transported and look when it gets to where you're going to buy it. Yep. Even if you're buying an heirloom tomato at Whole Foods, there's only certain tomatoes that can be transported that are heirloom. They've turned to mush. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's going to be store weed. And, and then I think there's going to be good weed. You know, I think there's going to be plenty of pot, plenty of cheap pot. I mean, fuck, I hear about people spraying it colors and coating it with THCA now. I mean, Jesus. Yeah, believe it. Fuck. Believe it. I mean, have you heard about that stuff? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's got terps fucking sprayed on it in extra uh, isolate, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, that means, you know, what I like is totally irrelevant, you know, so. But that's you know, there 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 is uh there's a lot of different types of market for pot, and I am a firm believer that we're gonna see a, a homegrown renaissance. I, I we're primed for it. Dispensary herb sucks. I quit. I, I mean, I I can't. I, the best herb in the dispensary is is way 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 overpriced and and it's only a certain type of herb yeah it it and it's stuff that can pass biological testing here in Colorado and not everything stops the biological activity i mean i've had stuff that I have jarred that was so dynamite, you know, people want, they think they want cured weed. I want fresh weed. Yeah. I, I want, you can't get it in the store. It's not there. Yeah. And and you see all this pictures of great looking weed on the hoof in the garden. It looks great. But someone was just telling me they're going to send their herb away off site hours away to have it trimmed by who knows who for 40 bucks a pound. Jesus Christ. So, I mean, what, what do you what do you expect? Yeah. And it's supposed to be good weed. Yeah, I so, I hope there's a homegrown renaissance. Um where I'm at, there isn't a, a connoisseur market of any type, you know, in Bakersfield, California, it's uh, few and far between people that are going to be like, I would rather have better than quantity, quantity that might get me a little high. You know, it seems to be that the, the whole attitude is just weed fucking smoke it, you know, around here. It would be nice to develop that, but I think it'll take so, so much time. So many people getting sick of the same old shit, but how, how, how long does that take to build in a in a society? I mean, because Colorado has has a history of good cannabis, but places like shitholes like this, not so much. You know, I mean, Colorado is a place where outdoor herb and and, and greenhouse herb to me is a hard sell. Yeah, um, we're used to indoor pot, but. You know the dispensaries have have changed everything. You know it's it used to be called Colorado Kind Bud. You know yeah, that, that's, that's that's not what we're we're working with now in general. Yeah, and the, you know the home grower culture. It was really strong. It boomed. It busted. But I'm hearing the people firing up the room again. So. I remember there was a little bit where you were going to different collectives and showing what you were getting at different collectives uh, over time. And I found that fascinating as well. 
uh, to get your take oh. on all these different strains and what they look like and what to expect from dispensaries when you were going there, what your money would buy you. They were all really fascinating. Well, I sure love to savage the sample edibles, you know. That's, yeah. You know, there's so many bad ideas. Uh, it's, you know, I've, I've, <laughs> there's there's been like, uh, there's been bumps. There's been, uh, you know, like nicotine kind of pouches. There's been jello shots. The jello shot was quite possibly the, the nastiest thing ever. Oh, my you know? God. And, and they, you know, there's a. Uh, How about the lean, the THC lean that looks like, you know, purple. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Scissor, yeah. the scissor. Yeah, the scissor. Oh, yeah. man. And, you know, and all the chads high-fived each other when they left the boardroom and thought that was a good idea. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Boom, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got lean weed. It's going to take off. But it, it's sad. You know, it's... Uh, the culture is is not... It's not here anymore. Yeah. I don't think it's... it's. Uh, I mean, I haven't visited California in a long time, but I, I hear, you know, the culture's pretty, pretty crushed and a few people hanging on and... Uh, the rosin thing has been really interesting to watch. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a couple years ago, if you would have told me that these guys would have well-developed private brands, you know, um, yeah. I, I would have been like, what? Like, <laughs> why? Why do you have to have your brand? Yeah. But now these guys are 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 doing well with it, and uh, the you know the six star hash kind of contest stuff. That's a little bit more than. I mean, I just like to to smoke it. I don't want to talk about it a whole bunch, <laughs> right? Or profile. I wish I, I wish I could still smoke it. Damn it! How I long are you gonna wait? wait? I, I don't know that I'm ever going to smoke hash again just because of how bad it triggered it. Just stick well, to when flour. When are you going to smoke um, flour? I'm just waiting for some uh, good samples to arrive since uh, I'm nowhere near harvest right now. Wait for someone to send me something good. We're smoking, you know? Oh, I'm going to get back in. It better be good. Wait six weeks. All right, six weeks and it's on. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, is there anything else you want to get in before uh, we wrap it up? I know that I'd, I'd really like to do some more check-ins with you and maybe some round tables as well. Sure. Have you, have you with some of the other dudes talking about different things, different, whether it be political or uh, the clone markets, what have you old strain talks. Um, you and CSI would be a fucking killer episode. So yeah. Is there anything else you want to get in for this, this round? Uh, I don't think so. It was good to finally. I know man. With you after trying for so long. It's been it's been a while. It's been a few years of chasing you down. Well worth it. Well fucking worth it, brother. But uh, you know, anybody who uh is looking for vigorous and healthy clones in Colorado that you can actually look at before you pay for them. Yeah. Give me a holler and you can find me at uh Harvest House Colorado on Instagram. There you go. Is it uh all one word? Uh, harvest underscore, uh, house underscore Colorado. Perfect. Yep. All right. And I'll put it in the description as well. Killer and, man. And dude, it's an absolute pleasure having you. It's an honor. And, uh, we'll be talking again soon. All right, dude. Have a good night. You too, brother. Great Thank you time. Sure thing. Want to sit at the table with the syndicate? Check out our Patreon in our link tree or description below. Our merch site is officially live. We have all sorts of shirts, hoodies, and goodies to sort you out, and shipping is super fast, and most importantly, the quality is top-notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out, syndicategear.com. We also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG, and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of breeders and growers. Come check it out.